you so much. This is really... So a really special thanks to, uh, to Carol for this invitation. I have a, a somewhat steady stream of invitations to speak about this project in San Francisco, but as you'll see, the, the anti-Manhattanization theme in this research is really, you know, forceful and in many ways it has helped frame the whole project. So this is uh, really terrific for me to have the chance to speak with you in a way that also uh, brings that out a little bit more. Um, and I'm, I welcome your thoughts. So for those of you who don't, or who aren't that familiar with San Francisco, the part of the city that I'm gonna focus on today is the, the North Waterfront, which is this stretch from uh, Ghirardelli Square, the kind of heart of historic preservation, and around uh, the bend to the Bay Bridge. Um, there's uh, Marin County and uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and uh, this is a kind of mid-60s uh, aerial photograph, and so we'll be uh, focusing a little bit on the, not just the historical uh, projects, the preservations projects, but also the urban renewal and modernist um, projects. Oops, sorry, get the, um, so what I'd like to do uh, this evening is to use the North Waterfront of San Francisco as a different site for rethinking the history of urban redevelopment from the 1940s to the 1970s. Um, and so that shifting of the East Coast to the West Coast um, will uh, hopefully kind of uh, reorient and bring out some, some different themes. Uh, from the ones that sometimes have uh, dominated uh, the literature of the time. And uh, you'll, you'll see that one of the, the um, a main premise of this project is that the 1960s is seen as a decade of cultural experimentation, of expansion, of ferment. But what I'd like to argue for you is that, uh, in fact, within the fields of urban planning and urban design, there was very much of a lockdown and in a way, a narrowing of, of that um, lens. And so that is, uh, in, in uh, many dimensions, the accomplishment of Jane Jacobs' 1961 book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Um, and it, it, the, the, the field was so hungry for new interpretations for, that, that's where that ferment comes in, right, in the late 1950s. Um, and so it, Jane Jacobs delivered this powerful new framework that, you know, arguably we're still, you know, debating and working with today. So one of the, the, the kind of other side of this bookshelf would be the publication of The Power Broker in 1974. To me, that kind of accomplished the other end of that lockdown of the preser of Jane Jacobs versus Robert Moses, the kind of preservation um, versus urban renewal, uh, the historical versus the modern. And um, it is, to give you a concrete example of this kind of power, the first time that I heard a reference to the redevelopment director of San Francisco, whose name was Justin Herman, as the Robert Moses of San Francisco was 1974, right after the power broker was published. So I think that that kind of framework, where instead of seeing what Justin Herman was doing in San Francisco on his own terms and what issues was he enveloped in, the inclination to say, this guy is the Robert Moses of San Francisco or the Robert Moses of, of Tokyo, um, kind of uh, obliterates what that history is on the ground. So you know that's the that's the um, the uh, premise of of uh, my talk today. I've come to think of books like this this one, The Ultimate High Rise, um, a 1971 publication of the Bay Area, as one of a set of forgotten but important in their time publications um, or or. Uh, manuscripts that never got published, of professions, of individuals, where cumulatively, it's almost like an alternative bookshelf to the Jane Jacobs, Robert Moses idea. So for the ultimate high rise, which I have to tell you, even people who live and breathe San Francisco redevelopment, many of them have not heard of this book uh, yet. 
I was able to find a review of it um, from 1972 that said, there probably has been no more important book on the urban question since Jane Jacobs, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. So I'd, I'd like, by the end of this, uh, this talk, to have made it plausible for you how that could possibly be true. What, what is this book that nobody knows about, The Ultimate High Rise, San Francisco's Mad Rush Toward the Sky? What is the content of it that, um, that could comprise part of this alternative bookshelf that really does offer a different set of, of issues and um, grounding the topic of urban redevelopment in, um, in, in, in another place, uh, literally. So basically, instead of the touchstone of Greenwich Village for Jane Jacobs, we have the North Waterfront of San Francisco. Um, and along the way, another kind of binary, I think, will unravel a little bit, and I'll, um, I'll let that unfold, but that's the, the premise of the so-called male domination of the profession of architecture and the apparent absence of women in the field. Um, so uh, you'll see that there are many professions that come forward when we focus on the Bay Area uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in decades when the churn of redevelopment activated allied professions, architectural model makers, publicists, property manage, managers, graphic designers, a whole host of fields um, that whether or not something was ever built, all of those professions were brought to bear. So in the Bay Area, you'll see that this is a, a, a a realm of kind of allied artistic fields that are deeply involved in urban redevelopment that if you ask people at that time, you know, for the credit for how this work got done, these people, these fields would have, those are the people that I write about. The people that everyone talked about in 1965 and most of them are not known today. So that kind of, everyone knew it, these were influential folks and fields, I think are, are part of that, um, part of that story. One of the reasons I want to throw out that, um, that Manhattan isn't always the, the kind of typical example. So for example, so like people knew that Greenwich Village was not typical America, right? But, but everybody thought that the arguments in Jane Jacobs' book were so compelling that they, they overlooked that idea. Um, but it's also true that Jane Jacobs was not anti-skyscraper. One of the unusual things about New York is that it had so-called Manhattanized much, much earlier than most other American cities. So a city like San Francisco, um, the, you know, the tallest buildings in the, the, the post-World War II building boom were 30 stories high. So for them, they're engaging with skyscrapers, not just urban renewal, but they're engaging with skyscrapers for the first time. So it's, it's coming together. Whereas in Manhattan, skyscrapers had a very different role. And I, I love this quote from uh, Death and Life where she describes Manhattan's, she's talking about lower Manhattan, the kind of early skyscraper boom. Um, and it's, she calls it the dramatic and romantic towers rising suddenly to the clouds like a magic castle girded by water. So we know that she was against the kind of urban renewal of the towers in the park and Le Corbusier, but she didn't have anything against skyscrapers. She didn't have anything against tall buildings. And so I think that that's a, uh, a meaningful um, distinction. And it's also, I juxtaposing this with uh, a, um, one of these 1971 cartoons, illustrations from the ultimate high rise, up for grabs. So this is a portrait of the North Waterfront. Um, I think it's an entirely unstudied field is the, the field of like illustrating and cartooning about, about um, urban renewal, skyscrapers. And so this, uh, this artist, Louis Dunn, this is his work, up for grabs already starts us, the, the, the arguments in, in the Bay Area and the North Waterfront are land center. It's about land grab. It's not always about, it's intention with design, but it's about land. Who has jurisdiction over the land? Who has responsibility um, for that land? And so this is, um, his critique I think fits the uh, contrast with the illustration of, uh, of Jane Jacobs. So for the quick um, uh, kind of footprint introduction, 
Here's the kind of the historic preservationist era. I'm going to speak very briefly about the Maritime Museum and the earlier, like late 1940s, uh, push for low-rise historical city that was pre-skyscraper. Um, and then uh, I'll be shifting back and forth a little bit between the. Um, yeah, I see this is. Yeah, there we go. You can see it a little bit, but uh, there's a massive. Um, redevelopment project here, the San Francisco uh, Inter uh, International Market Center site that was never built. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Transamerica Tower um, as uh, the two uh, skyscraper sites at the end. And then when I mentioned Golden Gateway, Embarcadero Center, these are on the far right um, as uh, uh, urban renewal sites. Um, and a little bit about the region because I will touch in on uh, the Sea Ranch on the uh, uh, um, northern coast a little bit. These are some of the sites that appear in the book, but I won't really be able to touch on them much. So I want to just gesture a little bit to the longer history of the focus on land in the Bay Area. So uh, there's a, um, uh, Henry George is one of the most famous theorists of the 19th century. When it's like, this was, his work was a, uh, a bestseller behind the Bible basically, and um, he was arguing, this is a, an illustration from uh, one of his um, 1870s publications that of the, of the land that was being given to the railroads. It turns out that his theory, which was seen as a national um, theory, was based on comparing Manhattan in 1869 and San Francisco. And what he said was that Manhattan had already long ago given away all its land. It's 1869. But San Francisco still had a chance. And that there was a possible future, a more um, democratic history. This is a, a Western state, of course. This makes the story, I think, a Western story as well as a West Coast story. Um, the land grabs, land is in the, in the newspapers every day because of the railroads and Western settlement. Just like land was in the newspapers every day in the 50s and 60s because of urban renewal. Um, so the kind of thing that George wrote about was um, this generation hence, our children will look with astonishment at the recklessness with which the public domain has been squandered. It will seem to them that we must have been mad. For certainly our whole land policy, with here and there a gleam of common sense shooting through it, seems to have been dictated by the desire to get rid of our lands um, as fast as possible. So going back you know, pretty early, we have this focus on land grab. So the, the, what, I, what I'd like you to take away from the couple of images I'm going to show you about the preservationist move in San Francisco um, is the way the story is told standardly, is as a kind of typical response to demolition, as a response to towers and skyscrapers, that there was an attention put on the historic fabric of the city. Uh, but what I'd like to argue differently is that the interest in a low-rise historic waterfront that is centered here on the Maritime Museum, and these these are the folks that like the early glimmers of South Street Seaport. You know, this is this is where they went for their advice because they pulled this off so beautifully. Um, that that in fact it was a um, an initiative for low-rise historic waterfront in the late 40s, predating the skyscrapers, that built on the uh, centennial of San Francisco's gold rush settling. So it actually was not reaction to towers. This, though, is the tower that everyone was talking about, the first one of the two Fontana apartments. It was like 20 stories tall. There were two of them together. That's the Ghirardelli Chocolate Factory. And um, the, 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 the threat was that this had broken an unspoken rule on the waterfront, that there would be no towers. There were laws, but there was an unspoken rule. And so the Fontana shook everybody up. Um, this was a proposal for Ghirardelli Center, that brick historic chocolate factory I just showed you. This is the actual structure that would have replaced it. So there were concrete plans on the, on the table. And then the way the story went is that a wealthy benefactor, Bill Roth, was approached with these scary drawings. This is what's going to happen to Ghirardelli. Square, uh, so you have to buy it. And it's like private benefactor buying the chocolate factory to save it from the tower destruction. 
The alternative story here that I'm just going to gesture to you is this one that is rooted in um, a young man named Carl Cordum, who was an independent guy from Petaluma, kind of a chicken ranching area just north of the city. And, but he was obsessed with boats. And he had some connections with a newspaper. He got the San Francisco Chronicle, an editor there on board, with this idea. They hired an illustrator. And they started to promote. So this is, this is 1950. This is, again, long before you have um, towers threatening anything. And you can see this, and it's even, it's before Disney, I just want to point out. <laughs> and you know, here's this kind of ye old commercial thing that's been rebuilt in the back that didn't exist. But basically, he had this vision of a cohesive, low-rise waterfront. This was the start of his vision with the ship um, and the old uh, aquatic um, center. And then, these are all of the different illustrators, particularly Hubert Buell, that he hired to help like, bring his plan to life. He was a visual thinker. And so he imagined a, the possibility in 1949 that this, using the same language of the anti-high-rise um, movement later, that instead of walling off a uh, city from its waterfront by commercial development, he saw that the brick factories walled off a kind of old, historic um, district that they could capitalize on and turn into this maritime museum. And so this, I think, gives you a sense. This, here's the promotional board that he used to carry this around and sell his idea. Um, and so the bottom line is that the waterfront in, the, in uh, California was covered with the mantle of, it was called public trust lands. And that land could not be sold. It could only be leased. And so he tapped into that. He tapped into this vision for a, a city a maritime museum and then built his way up through state parks and ultimately now this is a National Park Service site. And so he, he tied um, a kind of private vision to the, the public, the power of the public sector. Um, and here's Carl Cordum with his pointer and his plan for a state park. Um, he would come in with when when 10 years later the, the skyscrapers and large scale redevelopment are threatening San Francisco, he's one of the people that comes to the front to fight it. But it's also based on this longer term vision for what the city is. A second forgotten story would be the, the discovery um, that Grady Clegg, who's one of the leading kind of, this. Uh, this is an unpublished manuscript that I found that Grady Clay wrote about San Francisco exactly the same time as Jane Jacobs published her book. So Jane Jacobs was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Grady Clay was funded by the Ford Foundation. They're writing at the same time. But instead of Jane Jacobs' ideas, he puts forward the model that um, what, the way we have to understand urban renewal is it's a competition for urban land. And so he centers this on a very kind of different basis. Um, and his book was never published. So it's one of these manuscripts that you have to kind of explain how it fell off the shelf. Um, some of the things that he argued was the moment of climax in urban renewal is the sale of the land. Here the fate of the new neighborhood is decided. The developer is chosen. Um, he, he, one of the things that he um, liked so much about San Francisco and why he focused the book on San Francisco is that Justin Herman was open to the possibility that under urban renewal, cities should, should keep the ownership of the land rather than sell it to developers for the profit that everybody knew was the incentive. Um, admired that, and uh, in his book, he, he used the London case to contrast, and he said, this is a quote from a London County planning officer who said, it would be immoral for us to take land by compulsory purchase, condemnation, and hand it over, or sell it to one man or one company. Um, so, so basically, Grady Clay admired the San Francisco case because not these aren't the critics from the outside. These aren't radical, you know, activists. Um, these are people like Justin Herman, the redevelopment commissioner, who who wanted to look at ways that the city could keep ownership of its land instead of selling it to developers under urban rule. It's 1960, 1961, and that policy isn't set in stone. So he's saying he's trying to get that policy to be, um, to be reconsidered. 
Um, and so here's, uh, this is on the far left, that's um, Justin Herman signing a beam for one of the first urban renewal towers. Um, he also thought, he, he thought that mayors and policymakers did not understand architecture and urban design. And one of the, one premise of his work is that um, urban renewal, in, in other words, selling vast acreage of the most valuable land in a city was locking with urban design. And competitions are going to be won based on what he called dollars and design mix. But city administrators, urban renewal administrators, were not prepared to evaluate architecture. So that's what he thought that, that the public really needed to, these were called the sidewalk spectators. Uh, that this to him embodied the passivity of the, of the public in urban renewal. And what he thought was that this process of the, uh, the model, make the models, and this is a competition for Golden Gateway, would give you kind of a typical view. Many of you are, I'm sure, familiar with seeing many of these massive uh, urban design competitions. But remember that this was one of the first. And this is when, you know, in the United States in the post-war renewal period, um, and Clay was saying that San Francisco had done this really well. So we have to learn from Golden Gateway. We have to see what they did well. Um, and then here is one of the models. The uh, Golden Gateway is in the front. And then this kind of um, more Rockefeller Center looking thing is Embarcadero Center was the second commercial phase of this really substantial urban renewal project. So he said, we have to understand better how to interpret the models. And this was one of those behind the scenes. Like this was the classic, all the architects talking about the models at the presentation at the um, Urban Renewal Administration. This is one of the ones I couldn't use in the book because it was blurry, but I think it kind of captures that consultation. But it turns out that the model making industry was dominated by this, um, by this firm that was founded in 1951 by these two women, Lila Johnston and Virginia Green. So here is another one of those kind of like submerged and forgotten stories. But their company made most of the architectural models for all of the significant projects in San Francisco, plus around the world, because they were so good at what they did. Um, and so their work, the, the kind of, uh, their work in shaping the design process, um, so the Crown Zellerbach building was one of the first um, uh, uh, curtain wall steel skyscrapers in San Francisco in, I think, 55, and so they did the model for for, for this, so the model makers are deeply involved in large scale redevelopment. I mean, scale is what model makers do, and now it's all about large scale. Um, so their, their firm, this is a photo of their firm, um, a very large uh, company. They themselves, um, you know, kind of, the idea that model makers were kind of technically imitating like the craft work of, of the architect's designs um, was undermined by the fact that the, the model makers themselves, this was their, their award-winning modernist home, you know, they were abstract sculptors themselves, and the, the models were not, um, were kind of preceded the buildings, basically, you know, and the models were used to promote for uh, architectural competitions and to win prizes. So people wouldn't win the commission based on the building itself, but they might win it based on the models. And so this would have, this was something from uh, Virginia Green's master's thesis. <laughs> uh, and so the involvement that the model makers felt, we built San Francisco, Scale Models Unlimited, mm -hmm. like that kind of engagement um, in, in, uh, is a very multifaceted thing. The, I, I spent a little bit less time with the illustrators, but this is one example. It's of Embarcadero Center, um, Helmut Jacoby. And this was, so Jacoby, for example, was given the, the freedom to pick any five perspectives. He picked the perspectives, he picked the station point, and the, here what he was supposed to show was that um, the, the setback of the office towers that they would appear distant over the landscaped edge of the platform. So like the, the work of the illustrators, the model makers, 
um, were very fundamental. Here, what he's trying to show is that you could still see the ferry terminal building with the Embarcadero Center construction. Um, so there was a, a lot of debate about the design of Embarcadero Center. This would have been an example of one of the kind of back and forths about it created a wall, it was too tall, this was not broken up. Um, but the, the, land, um, it, the land sale underneath it was in many ways the, the big story. So this was a public piece of information that the, um, the, 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 uh, the team, Portman Rockefeller, had agreed to buy the five gateway blocks for $11 million, the largest sale of unimproved land in San Francisco's history. So the tension between the, um, the land and the design, you know, all the attention to the design, but not enough attention to the land and how it was being sold was one of the hallmarks. Um, just to uh, mention briefly, one of the other fields that was very important um, in Ghirardelli Square, the people that worked on Ghirardelli Square were the same people who worked on the San Francisco International Market Center, the big, massive redevelopment and historic <coughs> preservation. So that was one of the things that kind of eroded the preservationist, modernist divide. Um, so here you see Barbara Stauffaker. Um, so the role that the graphic uh, designer played in packaging the sales of these projects, um, she, she won uh, one of the Allied Arts Awards from the AIA. Um, her work leapt up from these um, you know, calendars and brochures, like the ones here, to redefine what was called super graphics, uh, is what she became famous for. So she's working with all of the modernist architects, and she's one of the graphic artists that gets credit for playing a role in uh, remaking a new field for graphics. So rather than just polluting the environment with irrelevant words that messed up the clean lines of modern design, that it was the two-dimensional paint could be seen as an inexpensive way of changing the form and the shape of the city. Um, here's a little bit of her work at Ghirardelli Square. Um, she worked at uh, the Sea Ranch development, um, which again shows you that the same people were doing the, um, the kind of, uh, this was a large-scale development, of large-scale redevelopment, um, the, the, and is renowned for how the design of the homes blended into the natural landscape. Um, what, and so she was uh, involved, this was her work to promote it. She got a lot of credit for it. Um, what she, the work that she did on the interior of the swim club, which you can see she tried to keep very subtle from the outside, you see the red arrow, um, got put on the front cover of Progressive Architecture in March 1967. And so um, this was the accomplishment of her colleague and friend, Marion Conrad, who was one of the go-to public relations people in architecture, real estate, and urban design in the city of San Francisco. So it's the same group of people, Conrad, Stauffaker, Green, um, Johnston, who are working on the preservationist projects and the modernist projects. Um, Conrad, for example, got, this is one of the first uh, feature stories in the Wall Street Journal, front page story on uh, modernist landscape architect Lawrence Halperin. That was Marion Conrad's placement. So the role that the public relations people played in making the careers of either Bobby Stafficker or Lawrence Halperin was an important part of, um, of the story. So this is uh, some of the, the work, I'll skip over it. But um, here was a critique by the Bay Guardian, um, which was the publisher of the ultimate high rise. So if you think of it, it's kind of the village voice of San Francisco. And it went right at this question of selling the waterfront. One of the interesting things about the, um, all the different like, illustrations and cartooning is that it's very little about architecture. They're not representing real buildings here. I mean, except for making up the Transamerica Pyramid, none of these are real buildings. They're just kind of fake stand-in rectangles. Marion Conrad here is, her importance is being acknowledged in a backhanded way. She's here as one of the proprietors of the waterfront. She did not have a skyscraper. She worked out of the basement of her Victorian home on Pacific Heights. Mm -hmm. So this is not about architecture. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an interesting down, uh, downplaying 
Um, but this is another one of those books that falls off the shelf because Bobby Staffworker wrote a memoir called Duped by Design, which is about the critique that the design promotion in the case of Sea Ranch here was using the idea of environmentally sensitive work to sell land, to commercialize the very land because of an environmental aura. And so um, she wrote this, this memoir, um, which she was not able to publish, even though she's published two or three other books with high-end architecture firm uh, uh, um, publishers, but she hasn't been able to publish that memoir, Duped by Design. Uh, just one um, gesture of how some of the gender issues were not just about who's doing the work and who's collaborating, mm -hmm would be a controversy at Girardelli Square between the modernist landscape architect Lawrence Halperin and the public artist Ruth Asawa. Um, the shorthand version is that this was cast as a public controversy. Halperin demanded that the sculpture that Ruth Asawa designed for the fountain in Girardelli Square, which were mermaids, should be removed. And he said he demanded this in the newspapers. He sent letters to all of the architects and newspapers, et cetera, in San Francisco and around the country that he could reach. Um, so that it was portrayed as ruining the balance of this preservation as kind of modernist accomplishment. But the, again, the kind of takeaway is that despite that art historical preservation and modernist framing, that the public in San Francisco read it as a question of, of, of gender. And that's in two dimensions. One was the intentionality of the artist. This is the um, sculpture being installed in the middle of the night in um, March uh, 1968. Um, the Ruth Asawa celebrating. It was supposed to fit in like it had always been there. It's there on the right hand side. This was the kind of sculpture, this was the sculpture that Lawrence Halpern envisioned for the site, not these mermaids. Um, and Asawa, as you can see, presented herself, this was her, her, her work for which now she has become you know, famous, or she has now recognition. Um, she passed away several years ago. But she, her, her image was a maternal one. So you've got two things going on. This was her favorite picture of herself working. She's working. But she had like six children. And she was known for this abstract uh, woven metal sculpture. But for Girardelli Square, she did her first representational work. And this was the two, the two mermaids and a merbaby. And it turns out that she intentionally was producing what looks like a nursing woman in public, which, believe it or not, it's San Francisco in 1968. That was still controversial. I mean, it seems like it might not be, but it was. And so the public is you know, writing in about the, the nursing mermaids. Uh, and, uh, and, this, it, and she modeled the mermaid on her friend who had just had a baby. And this was the wax model, which to me has the closest resemblance to the you know, kind of human body connection. And so intentionally, Ruth Asawa was making a political statement. This is like a feminist piece of sculpture before we talk about feminist art history in many ways. And the public um, responded also protecting her. This was, this, was in, this was in Halpern's files. So an architect sent it to him. And basically, people said he couldn't handle like a woman kind of controlling public space. Like, so it wasn't just the nursing mermaid story, but it was also the public artist as a woman. Uh, and so this was what uh, he got in his mail. So the, there were a lot of you know, people wrote in, somebody wrote a really pretty bad poem, but it's, it's, the content is, uh, uh, is about um, the, the mermaids, or two mermaids, so it's a lesbian family. And you know, it's like peeling the onion. It is all about gender and sexuality. Um, the, the frogs, there's one letter that says the frogs are fornicating. <laughs> the frogs. Uh, and uh, Naomi Wolf, in her memoir, Promiscuities, about growing up in San Francisco in these years, writes about the mermaids 
juxtaposed with Carol Doda and the Condor Club and the proliferation of topless dancing in the city. So it's all about the neighborhood. You know, it's, it's about that question of sexuality in public. And it's not only about um, modernism versus historicism. So if this is a photo from Ruth Asawa's perspective, the intimate view of the mermaids and the history and the bay, and this is Lawrence Halpern's vision of the seam plaza. It's modernist. It's stark. This is what he wanted. It's the same plaza. All the new buildings of Gary Elliott are there. This one is about the property managers. This is the construction of the, the remaking of the site. Again, just a gesture to yet another profession that was absolutely critical. Um, the property managers, uh, Stewart and Curry Rose, um, who were often called like the co-developers or uh, the co-directors of the square. Uh, they, the Bill Roth credited them. He hired them because they had developed basically a prototype in the 50s in Sausalito, in Marin, right across um, the, uh, the, uh, the bay. And so their, I, they brought their ideas. So the landscape architects and the architects got the credit. But if you, if you look in the story, you see the role that, you know, Curie Rose went back and forth, back and forth with Halper, and she ripped out all his plants after he left. You know, she says she, she rearranged everything except the concrete built-ins that couldn't. So, so it, was, it was about property manager versus landscape architect, and not just about the landscape architect jurisdiction with the architect, for example. Um, so so uh, to, to end, I have this last section on the anti-Manhattanization. This is the, you know, where did this anti-skyscraper sentiment come from um, in San Francisco? And to my eyes, it's a very multi-pronged thing. It's not just about design. It's not just about tall buildings, the shape of tall buildings, or where they're located. But it, it also was imbued with some other, um, some other issues besides uh, design. Um, so here, uh, just to point out, because we'll look at it a little bit more closely, Merchant Street, which goes underneath the Transamerica Pyramid, and Hodling Place, which dead ends into the Transamerica Pyramid. Um, the main takeaway here is that although there were a lot of design issues, and the Transamerica Pyramid is the classic design thing, because people responded to the triangular shape, the pyramid shape, right? That, that, and its location, that it was moving the business district north. So it was, on the surface of it, a design issue. But the, the point that I'd like to make is that it was actually a set of lawsuits. These, they were called street vacation lawsuits. And they were about the policy of vacating the, the street, public street property and selling them to the developers at bargain basement prices. An example, like this was, and these were cases that they won. They, they won in appeals, these street vacation lawsuits. Um, obviously, the Transamerica Pyramid was still built. You know, but, but the principle of using these lawsuits to stop projects and to establish the principle that the public street mattered and shouldn't just be swallowed up into a development, that um, the skyscraper was in everybody's benefit, that was something that had traction and worked in San Francisco. I don't think you had street vacation lawsuits in Manhattan you know, that in the 60s. So when you're assembling, now you've got large scale of development and to compile a parcel, you need the public streets. So how is that going to be turned over, basically? You know, if it's not, a, even when it was a public project, that could also be something that was debated. Yeah, well, yeah. super blocks, though. World Trade Center, that were, for example. I know, and that, I've, I've often thought about the World Trade Center site, like when the original super block was created from public streets, did anybody even think that was an issue? Because it was kind of a public project, too. Mm -hmm. you know, Radio but, Row, there were a lot of pro protests. That's right. OK, so and that was about you know, so the, the closing and sale of those streets to create the super block yeah. is basically, you know, so this was what, these were the lawsuits. Um, here's the example where the lawsuits won. The International Market Center, um, huge project. Like, everything you see here on the right side, crawling up Telegraph. This so, is what the neighborhood looks like today. Um, if this is what it, this was one of the first, although this is a, 
a 60s photo. But the developer for this quietly bought all this land in the late 50s and early 60s, modeling it on urban renewal. They worked for Justin Herman. They knew the strategies for buying the land. And they presented like a tall hotel there in the middle. They talked about it like a design question. It's massive. It's too big. The hotel is too tall. Um, uh, Jean Cordham was one of the, she's Carl Cordham's uh, spouse. She was one of the anti-development you know, development activists. Um, and these were the watercolors that were supposed to convince you that the project would blend in. Carl Cordham called this a green hairpiece covering <laughs> a, you know, a horrible mass. This would have been the, the fourth largest building, I think, on the West Coast or the United States or something like that. It was a massive building. It was a furniture warehouse. Uh, but this was another kind of duped by design argument, green hairpiece. So he's saying mm -hmm. like the design questions, they're offering you a public park, eight stories tall, on top of this horrible building. So, you know, you're but you which you don't don't give away the public land, which would have been twenty-two percent of the footprint of this private project. Um, so right when the market center collapsed because of those lawsuits, the Transamerica Pyramid was per uh, proposed. Um, this was the earliest version of it. What ultimately was built, as you know, was squatter and shorter. Um, <coughs> there's a whole world of the cartooning that was done about Transamerica. Um, here's it uh, moving the business district north. Um, and this is the, the, the streetification question, it, it's not like a really sexy kind of illustration. Like these are the, you know, these are the drawings of the land Merchant Street was being sold to Transamerica, basically. And here you see it slowly becoming Transamerica property. Um, but this was the subject of these lawsuits that stretched on by these unknown, you know, lawyers that I dug up, who the, the Transamerica was arguing that the small streets were not very important, and of course you could just sell them to the developer. You know, they didn't really do that much in the city, but the but it raised the you know the kind of counter argument was hotel in place, which actually dead ends into Transamerica, which had become this kind of um, Jackson Square, the first historic district in San Francisco. It was seen as the small streets kind of kept the structure and prevented overdevelopment. Was the thought. Um, in San Francisco. So the, the ultimate high rise, you know, showed, these are the folks who brought you the ultimate high rise, uh, who went on, it was kind of like an incubator for land use lawyers and, you know, publishers, the alternative press, um, that kind of world, which contrasted very much in its makeup with, you know, the kind of power structure of San Francisco of the exact same moment. This was from a book, uh, the only book I know of that has land grab in its title, from 1974, about San Francisco. So it's a very different kind of um, culture of people involved. And what these people's guides were arguing was, like these were facts, finding out you know, who owned what land in your neighborhood and what urban rule was planned for your neighborhood is something that you can find out, and here are the tools. So it's kind of like a Grady Clay type thing. Like, don't sit back. Don't wait for the bulldozers. You know, get out there, find out, um, kind of get informed. Um, and then this would be that uh, genre of the of the skyscraper illustrations, which uh, again they they kind of downplayed design. The the criti critiques downplayed design to play up the what they saw as the um, the kind of trade off. Or in this case. The trade-off is that the public gets that little pier that's being pointed to in the middle, but loses its waterfront in the meantime. You know, so they're like, don't be distracted by these big buildings. Like that's you know what you know you don't 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 give in to these uh, public benefits like like parks and so uh, Coit Tower Preserve, and, um, the role of the media, the San Francisco Chronicle never reviewed the ultimate high rise, just as an example. You know, so like that in, in, the, in 1971, that kind of um, anti, uh, 
you know, like they, they were the rabble rousers. Um, uh, so different metaphors for skyscrapers, like in this Vietnam, skyscrapers being dropped like bombs, skyscrapers being planted like seeds, uh, not architectural metaphors, I don't think. Um, but land was in the, in the news. So this is, a San, I'm telling you a San Francisco story, but here's one from um, uh, the Shaw neighborhood in DC. This was Bill Street, he's an architect and a planner. Um, who was very much, he was in, in, at the forefront of the black land movement, uh, the, the focus on land and urban rule, and, uh, but he wasn't an obstructionist. He wasn't like resisting development. He actually wanted to use the tools of development. He thought that you know, the neighborhoods should have the tools of urban renewal to be able to do for themselves what the you know, other uh, folks controlling urban renewal wanted to do. So it wasn't obstructionism, um, just like the International Market Center, it wasn't obstructionism. It's like the development should go somewhere else. You know, these were, these were professionals. So a kind of composite bookshelf here um, of, the, of the land questions, the, um, the, the gender side that, um, that rather than you know, that rather than focusing on, on how, you know, there's so many articles about why didn't women's liberation have as much of an impact on architecture as it did on law, as it did on, you know, medicine, as on so many other fields. But I think also here there's like, you might also ask, how did women's liberation intersect with this other generation of people who were very deeply involved, a kind of mixed gender uh, world of, um, of urban design. Um, and then just to the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco has gotten just open, it's gotten a lot of press. I like this image because it shows you that you know the Transamerica Pyramid really did stop you know, the, the move of the, um, the business district north. Um, it, it remained the tallest building in San Francisco until Salesforce. But at the same time, you know, I think the focus on the height of the tower is part of that distraction of design. You know, that, that really, to me, the question, it's, not, it's a tall building, but really you know, people in San Francisco would have to ask, um, do we need to renegotiate the set of compromises that we have, you know, that have controlled the type of growth in the way that that we have controlled it as a city. Um, this period from 67 to 72, um, you know, which kind of ended with the, basically with the Transamerica and then those streetfication lawsuits, um, this really filled, that citizen initiative filled a gap. You didn't have the urban design plan yet. You know, the, the, that was 1971, like the a California Environmental Quality Act, you know, that, those were the regulations that people have, have used um, since this period, and those street vacation lawsuits were, you know, were less singular again at that at that time. Um, and I can't resist this because I show this to my uh, undergraduate class at the end of the semester, but um, it's this opportunity to show it here. When I saw the design. Uh, it's for the tower, and I, it, it just uh, to me it was an echo of the Transamerica pyramid, and it just reminded me of the question that you know design as an as a as an issue um, can only take you so far, and in some ways that's what all of this churn in San Francisco was about, like pointing out you know the design really mattered, but it was also in tension with all of these questions about you know the land, the public trust land you know, for the waterfront, um, the, uh, the street vacation lawsuits, you know, that that was also something, the competition for urban land that Grady Clay was the, said was the way that we should frame our thinking about redevelopment. So, thanks. Cities, but do you think this is sort of like a regional expression of 
the kind of urban renewal and sort. And then as you dig into all these cities, you'll see these complicated structures. Or is San Francisco kind of a, an outlier? I think that you know, just like you know, just like Jane Jacobs managed to crystallize something that a lot of people were thinking in 1960. Um, I think that San Francisco was like the the like deepest, richest embodiment of this set of concerns. But you do see it in a lot of places, which is why I threw in the like the Black Land Movement, you know, example because you see it in other, you see it all over. Like in Asbury Park, um, I helped somebody do a documentary film on Asbury Park, a woman whose grandmother's house was being lost to eminent domain. And publicly, the city had sold its waterfront because it was desperate. And the, when the developer went bankrupt, they were auctioning the Asbury Park waterfront at, on Wall Street somewhere. <laughs> you know? So like there, she was pointing out public information, like, the city sold its waterfront, this isn't a secret. And maybe selling the waterfront wasn't the right way to do it. So I, I saw a lot of echoes there. Um, or New Orleans, rebuilding in New Orleans would be, I think, another really good example where you have, like in the immediate aftermath of Katrina, um, there's this one example that I was really drawn to. This, this neighborhood guy stands up and shouts at the redevelopment administrator and he says, I hate you, Mr. Canazaro, because you're scheming to get my land. And the answer to that is, of course. You know, like that's, that's right. He shouldn't be seen as the angry guy, the angry neighborhood guy, because he's just trying to use the same, you know, he's competing for the urban land. You know, and that that should be kind of open, that should be conceded. Let's just compete for the urban land and not label some people as resisting or obstructionist or angry neighborhood guy, whereas the developer gets to be the good guy, you know, the, the one with the tool. Um, so that, I think, is, yeah, that's where I would look for it. Any questions? Well, I was wondering what's happening now in San Francisco now with uh, the tech giants and all the pressure to obviously build more. I mean, the pressure to uh, add more housing, add more office buildings, and all that. It's um, it, what what's the change that you see now, and, and how quickly will all of that just snowball into something even bigger? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think. I guess what I would say is it's really interesting to me that the Salesforce Tower kind of crystallized some of that anxiety, um, but it, because of the symbolism of it being the tech world. Um, but like the, to me, the towers get renamed. You know that better than I do. And so like, I, I, I understand it's important. You know, it's an important symbolism, but they might rename it in 10 years. I think it's the underlying question that it's, it's not whether the Salesforce tower is tall or whether we like its design or whether it's Salesforce and how, but it's like, it's I think those other questions of, um, you know, the access to urban land and what responsibility is it possible to renegotiate those conditions of affordable housing of, you know, is it possible to control that? Um, it, like that's where one would, one would look, I guess. Could you clarify, though, about Salesforce's tower? Because I had this question um, a, a, a few weeks ago. Wasn't it originally the Trans Bay project? That's right. That's, That's right. right. Just, it was yeah. the bus terminal. That's the market. So isn't it, that, wasn't that a public authority? Who that's right, and that? that's what a lot of people pointed out, that it's, it's part of a really like, admired urban design. You know, and that Salesforce liked what was going on, and so they bought in, and they so put their name on it. absolutely nothing to do with the symbolism of where the, or the yeah. engineers or but people think, or, yeah, like they they they. Um, I agree with you, you know, but uh, but I that's not the way people see it. You know, they see it as the symbolism of the tower, and then they argue what you just said. <laughs> So that is the Salesforce Tower, is the old bus terminal, the Cesar Pelli Tower, and it is a whole shopping mall there? Uh, you know, I'd have to... It's just below I, Yes, I think so, right? Because that's the... Salesforce Tower. Yeah, so... Um, right. That's right. 
because I the architect well, I, contacted I, I, me. That used to be, uh, I mean, I lived there in the 70s, that was like, no, it's all warehouse. And now that of architects started having their offices there, because it used to be, like going to Soho or something, uh, uh, down here, down here, in Market, by the ferry building. Uh, here in New York, all the things you talked about seem kind of several steps uh, below the decision-making process. Uh, this notion of urban design, uh, streets not being so. We live in a city here where our mayor has never met a developer he did not like. <laughs> and he is going to do anything to curry favor with these developers. These developers support him. They don't support only the mayor. They support council people. They support with donations to their p political campaign. And until that changes, and we make a disconnect between that electoral process and the built environment, and I'm, it doesn't matter where it is in New York City, we are going to be drowning in bad planning, bad decision making, the inability to look at a project in a total sense, not just its own little building, whether it has brick or marble or glass. And we're in big trouble here. And the only thing we could hope is that these buildings are not going to last as long as the Woolworth building. Might have been because it could be built like crap. You know. Can I add on the other? Since that was a, more of a statement than a question, but um, on the on the other side of that issue was was San Francisco pressured with population growth and housing issues, uh, housing affordability issues, even in this moment uh, for urban renewal. Was the motivation for urban renewal to meet demand or just to do economic development? build it and they will come. Right. Um, the, the examples of urban renewal that I focused on in San Francisco were the more with the um, commercial redevelopment, you know, bring the middle class back downtown. That's what Golden Gateway was. Um, so bring the middle class back downtown. So like what I, I was, there were really two very different kinds of urban renewal. There was the neighborhood clearance, which was like the Western edition, um, Yerba Buena, you know, so that was the bulldozer story. And for me, what was so different about this is this is the construction crane. You know, this is where, you know, basically Jane Jacobs had the opportunity to be on the Golden Gateway Selection Committee and she turned it down because she said, I don't believe in urban renewal. And Grady Clay said, that's a big mistake because whether you believe in it or not, the neighborhood's been cleared. You know, that's what his position was. He didn't value judge urban renewal itself. He said, it's what we have. We have cleared all of this. So now let's, what are we gonna put in there and let's make it the best possible thing. And we all have an obligation to see that that's what happens. So, um, yeah, so there were, there were kind of two different types. Are you saying that she should have accepted that role when in fact, it was a losing, it was a lose-lose proposition. You know, she was a figurehead then. She would have just been used as a pawn. There was no, she had no power. Well, she actually, had that's... It. No, that, it's... You mean the Golden Gateway? It stacked, it was stacked against her. <laughs> it was it, a total sham. Well, Grady Clay was like, he thought it was the best competition ever, and, uh, but... Yeah. Yeah. Um, how much of the debate, so if the question is about land, it's not about design, how much of the debate centered on who actually owned the land? So was it really about like corporate America taking over downtown and that being the issue? So like with residential urban renewal, the question is often like, are you going to build a luxury development or are you going to build subsidized housing or co-op or something? But with commercial real estate, it seems a little bit less clear, like with this downtown zone, what would have been a more equitable skyscraper or a more equitable use of this land other than like, you know, at and or whatever, Fortune 500 company occupied these buildings? Was that, was that at all part of the discussion? 
I think it was kind of, there were two different types. One were the redevelopment parcels. So like Embarcadero Center, that was Rockefeller. And that really underscored the anti-Manhattan thing because in part the designs were echoing Rockefeller Center. And that's where the question of why are you selling them the land came in. I believe it was more important that these were outsiders, they were not San Franciscans, you know, as in a way, uh, it, but also the fact that maybe we don't need to sell it. You know, maybe we should keep it because the, the, all of the real estate appraisals, everybody knew the land was more valuable, you know, than, than it was being sold. Everybody knew it, it was public information. So that, that's part of what it was, was hard to understand. But then like Transamerica and the street vacation lawsuits was about the corporations. That was basically saying, sure, you have this parcel, you basically can build whatever you want on it until the new urban design plan kicks in, but the moment you ask for the public street, you have to deal with us. You know, and that we don't think it's right to give the corporation more height or more you know, footprint and more height and more bulk and more rental area from what is the public street. And that's, they, they took issue with it. They, made, they, 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 they argued that on principle is, is what, it wasn't just a strategy to take down projects. It was a principle that that wasn't right. And they also sold it at like half price, which is a long, complicated <laughs> story. I'm, I'm curious if you can talk about, or maybe give some examples about uh, the impacts that uh, were had on the social fabric of the city um, as a result of both, not just the urban renewal projects that were realized, but also this anxiety against a lot of these projects, um, and maybe how that reflects on the city and its current situation today. Yeah, that's a really good question, and it kind of asks you to step back. Um, one of the things that distinguish the projects that I worked on is that in many cases, there really weren't that many residents who were displaced. You know, all of them. You know, like in Ghirardelli Square, nobody really lived there. And um, the, there were, you know, several hundred families, but nothing on the order of these other kinds of urban renewal. So the type of anxiety that people felt was this sense of like, what is our public good? You know, like uh, they're, they're selling the waterfront, you know, think of that, that image and how to get people to care because it's not that their own home was threatened or that they knew people who were being relocated. So there wasn't like an automatic constituency. So it was a more like abstracted sense, like we, a small band of lawyers that you've never heard of, you know, are gonna get together and argue week after week at the Board of Supervisors for the public good. You know, I don't have anything at stake here, that kind of thing, but it's for the public good. This is, I, I mean, I don't know that much about the history of public interest law, but I kind of imagine that that's in part what was going on there, is like that is what they were creating one version of, is that some people have a role to play. You know, some people can step into the policy process and and have a big impact. And that's what these, these were often retired guys, you know, women who, um, it, it, so that, I think that might be in part an answer. Yeah. Oh, I would say that um, looking at public housing or the big housing developments, they did a lot of demapping the streets, which were given to the various, you know, the authority, public authority for develop, private uh, developers. But, you know, thinking about this is getting back to the grid, you know, that the size of the blocks because I think about commercial redevelopment, there isn't a lot of this need because the blocks are so big. But I kind of get the feeling that the blocks generally a lot smaller. So you can't put it, if you put together these big sites here, right? And it's half a block, right? You know, but whereas I feel like in San Francisco, maybe that's not the case. Yeah, that, um, that, yeah. <laughs> that would be a, um, uh, that's an interesting question. I, and I don't totally know the answer. Like I know how the San Franciscan, uh, the, the urban planners, the urban designers, like that whole thing about the small streets create right. the structure that prevents large buildings. Right. That, like that's the legal There's framework. The structure that encourages, in essence, even by the problems and so forth. That's right. But I don't actually know the fact. That's an interesting, yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to slice it. 
You yeah. talked about the Salesforce building a couple times, but its uh, infamous, uh, infamous neighbor next, right next to it is the Millennium Tower, which is sinking and tilting. Oh, yeah. And it's also the heaviest concrete building in the western U.S., the right. Millennium Tower. But I don't really see it that well in this picture. Is it kind of hidden by the the uh, Salesforce Tower? I don't know. It's just, yeah, I'm not. It's, um, I'm actually, I don't, I don't know. I've been reading about it, too, but I'm not. Um, it's uh, kind of scary, though. It might have cheered down. What's that? This picture might be before. Uh, no, this one is yeah, that's newer. Just like a few yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, you know, the, it's a good question, kind of the safety of, of high-rise buildings in San Francisco. You know, not surprisingly, people, have, people ask, you know, does it, as an earthquake-prone area, is that also a reason why they were anti-skyscraper? But it's surprisingly, I don't think, although, like, the ultimate high-rise tried to fear-monger on that a little bit, like, some of the illustrations you know, depicted the skyscrapers like matchbooks and, you know, like the, that they would crumble and go up in flames. And there's a little bit of fear mongering, but I found it surprisingly, and maybe this is an engineering answer, but um, there really wasn't a lot of anxiety or concern about the, the structural side, you know, the safety of building these tall buildings in San Francisco, much less than I would have thought. Well, it's anchor a landfill and then go to the bedrock. That's the problem. It just yeah. You know, it's landfill is how it's hundreds of feet. So, you know. There are plenty of places like Mexico City, where which have worse problems, but and they're built on mud. And Shanghai is built on mud. It's, it, there, there's no impediment. Chicago is built on mud. You know, so it's possible. Um, I think this is probably a good time to have more informal questions for Allison and to thank her for a really wonderful talk. Thank you. And thank you. I haven't been here before. We have, uh, uh, we've already been here for 14 years now and we're, we're um, working our way up. Um, it's 20 years since the founding of the museum, and that's relevant to the exhibition that I think you'll, I hope you'll have a chance to look, to look around or come back in order to see in, um, and uh, read in some more detail or on our website uh, that looks at Lower Manhattan in the 1990s. So a very recent history and a, a, a little bit of a social policy history of Lower Manhattan. Um, and uh, we, we like to look at the history of New York and the history of, ci of cities generally. I'm going to do a little promo for those of you um, who aren't familiar with our regular book talk series, which is once a month in general. Uh, we, look at, we have an author come and talk about uh, a recent book in architecture or cities, um, urban history, a whole range of topics, and if you come back next week, uh, next Tuesday, Steve Cohen, who's the uh, executive director of the Earth Institute up at Columbia, is going to talk about uh, the sustainable city and strategies for um, sustainability, sustainable urbanism beyond New York, uh, but especially um, focused on some of the uh, practices uh, that the Earth Institute has, has been uh, studying and trying to apply, well, to the Earth, I guess. Uh, but tonight we look at um, a favorite topic uh, and a favorite discipline of the Skyscraper Museum, which is um, urban history, and I guess you call yourself a social historian, really. I mean, you, you said that earlier. Um, but Alice and I have overlapped in our academic careers through the uh, SACRAP, which is the um, Society for um, Society for American, American City and Regional mm -hmm. Planning History. It's like a there you go, SACRAF. Yeah, once you once you say it, you can't deconstruct it anymore. But um, but in fact, deconstructing is is, is really kind of the theme of uh, of this group that brings together the disciplines and the practitioners who look at cities from the perspectives of planning, from history, uh, from uh, social studies from from analysis of, of people who really look to, to who like to look hard at cities and to see how they work um, and to be involved in the, the planning and the, the practice of urban policy 
Um, and uh, Alison Eisenberg, uh, who is our speaker tonight and whose book you um, all have uh, uh, seen something about, Designing San Francisco, Art, Land, and uh, Urban Renewal in the City by the Bay, looks uh, at that other coast, the other left coast um, over there, but um, finds many issues uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of periods and eras of history uh, of resistance and of, uh, part of civic participation uh, that we see in New York and, and that many of the historians of our generation have uh, a kind of lens that we, we brought to the study of urban history. So it's a particular delight to have her debut, uh, her, um, this just recently published book, which, but which has already garnered uh, just in the last week or so, I guess, the, the news of two uh, important prizes, the, uh, the 2018 Prose Award uh, for Architecture and Planning, and the J.B. Jackson Prize from the Cultural Landscape uh, Foundation. So social history, cultural landscapes, um, the, this, this book brings together all these, these different perspectives on looking at the city, but in a historical um, frame and seeing uh, history as, as an important uh, form, uh, forming force uh, in the way that, that cities are, are made through time. Um, Allison is a, a, a professor at uh, Princeton University, and she uh, um, has uh, previously taught for many years at Rutgers. Uh, she did her dissertation at University of Pennsylvania, and that um, research played out in her first uh, multiple award-winning book, which was uh, Downtown America uh, from 2005. And so also warm, uh, warming my heart is the idea of books that take at least a decade in order to, to put together and, and get out. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is one of those, and it follows on another massive work um, that is uh, very kaleidoscopic, but also um, focused on a series of, of um, different kinds of lenses in, in which to understand the, um, the actions of, of uh, people and social forces in the city. Uh, and she also, I wanted to mention, uh, is directing the Princeton and Mellon Initiative on Architecture, Urbanism, and the Humanities, which also emphasizes an interdisciplinary studies. Is that enough? Oh my God, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Here's Allison.